Boys, 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 I just found out Koreans are going extinct. So one of the best ways to figure out if a species is going extinct, if a species is endangered, is to take a look at three generations and go, okay, if the population of this species goes down by 50 to 75% over the course of three generations, then it's likely the case that this animal is going to go extinct. Now, here's something crazy for you. The birth rate in Korea right now is 0.68 children per woman. Now, you need 2.1 children per woman, right, in order to maintain your population. If you want your population to grow over time, you need to have more than 2.1. 2.1. Right now, the global average is 2.4. In Korea, the average is 0.68. And this is a big problem because it means that the Korean population is not only going to shrink, but shrink exponentially. So for example, if you take 100 Korean people and they have a birth rate of 0.68, it means in the next generation, you're going to have 34 people, which means in the next generation, you're going to have 12 people, which means in the next generation, you're going to have four people. So just to be clear about what that means, over the next century, you're going to have 100 great-grandparents turn into four great-grandchildren. That means that your population is going to shrink by 96% over the course of three generations. Can you imagine what a city, what the roads, what the coffee shops, what the superstores would look like in a country where 96% of the people disappeared? And not only that, it's not getting better. So in data from all across the modernized world, fertility rates are going down and governments are scrambling and trying to pay people to have more kids, giving people tax breaks, etc. And there hasn't been a country that's hit a floor yet. In other words, as a country dips below replacement fertility, basically they begin to nosedive down and there has never been a civilization that has nosedived in terms of fertility and then come back. And South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Japan, Spain, Italy have all been working really hard to try to convince their populations to have more children and nothing is working. Now you might say, well, it's the economy, you know, people are having a tough time affording things and so they can't afford children. And that might be a proximal reason, but I don't think that's the ultimate reason. And there's two reasons for that. So first of all, people were way more poor a hundred years ago, but on average they had six kids instead of 2.4, like we're having worldwide now. And the other thing is all of the countries in which the fertility rates are plummeting are countries that are wealthy. This is not happening in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's not happening in countries like Chad, for example. It's only happening in wealthy, modernized countries where the standard of living is high. So what is it then? Why are people not falling in love, getting married, and having children all across the modernized world? The answer will probably shock and offend you. Although if you're the kind of person that watches my channel, then you like this stuff anyway. The answer is summed up by David Bloom, who's a Harvard demographer. He says this, increased levels of female education have been the single most important driver of falling fertility rates globally. Women with more education have greater access to information, opportunities for employment, control over their reproductive choices, which leads to smaller family sizes. Yeah, unfortunately, it's also leading to the collapse of civilization and the extinction of Koreans. So just to paint the picture here, Korea's population for the first time since the Korean War went down by approximately 50,000 people this year, and it will continue to go down until who knows and it seems to be because 75 percent of korean women graduate college and only 64 percent of korean men do the same okay so if according to demographers the greatest indicator for the collapsing of population sizes is female education then why is it so pronounced in South Korea. I mean, 0.68 is wild. You know, Greece is up at 1.36, Portugal's 1.37, but 1.68 is really low. Why is it so pronounced in South Korea as compared to other countries? And there's a lot of answers to this, but I think one of the main ones, and this is one of the ones that Korean guys are talking about on the internet a lot, is military conscription. So in Korea, when a guy graduates high school, he has to go serve two years in the military, whereas women don't. And because college and university is so important and ubiquitous within Korea, you end up giving young women a two-year head start to their career. So by the time a woman is, say, 23, which by 
the way, is when historically she would be settling down, finding a mate, having children. Instead, now she looks around for somebody who is approximately equal or above her in social status, which is what women tend to do when they look for a mate. And when she looks around at guys her age, she's basically gonna find nobody who's at her level or higher in terms of income or educational attainment. And because Korea is under a... Okay, buddy. Okay. And because Korea is under the Chibol system where, you know, you have a company like Samsung that basically owns an entire province, you tend to want to work at one of the major companies. So basically the goal in life of a proud set of parents is that their kid would go to college and then rather than starting their own company or, you know, risking failure in that kind of venture, the goal would be that you would get a great job at Samsung. So one of the unique things about a system like that is you end up making certification the greatest indicator for social status as opposed to productivity, like real productivity being the greatest measure of social status. So for example, in the US, people might be much more amenable to the idea of you being an entrepreneur and failing and failing and failing over and over in your rabid pursuit of real productivity. Your social status in some sense would be greatly determined and recognized by the actual change that you bring about in the world as compared to a system with a very clearly defined hierarchy where what you want is to be recognized as having a position within this hierarchy because that grants you the status that you want. And so you can see there a slightly different ethos, right, between universities and corporations and this kind of entrepreneurial adventure American dream kind of spirit where in the West, if you fail and fail and fail and then succeed in the pursuit of creativity and productivity, then that's almost seen as kind of cool. There's kind of this redemption arc. Whereas in a place like Korea, where it's university and corporation, your certification, your status is everything. And there isn't so much of a redemption story for those who take a hit in status because the fundamental measure of status is not productivity, it's placement. So if you take the placement of woman and you elevate it such that they now see men their age as slightly below them, well, there's two problems that happen there then. First of all, you're gonna have hypergamy increase because women are gonna go, well, I want a guy who's more educated than me, but all of the guys my age are less educated than me, so I'm not attracted to anyone, therefore I don't date, therefore I don't get married, therefore I push off having children. But also, and this is the big one, I think you can see reflected in a lot of Korean media, like Squid Games and Parasite and that eight show that came out. A lot of it is this nihilistic tragedy where it's like, Look how bad we are to each other when all we care about is social status. And there's this kind of yearning for something beyond a system that only recognizes value in terms of placement. And so one of the downstream effects of that system is that if you take it and inject highly educated women into it, you basically start to see women not for their intrinsic value, not as life givers, not as having a type of value and status which is unique and independent from men's, but instead you start to measure them based on education and income in the same way that men have been judged forever since the dawn of time. And so the big problem with that is this. This is the reason why birth rates are falling in Korea. It's the reason why it's falling all across the modernized world is that if you convince women that their status is rolled up in proxies for competence, they will pursue the proxy for competence because motherhood is not a proxy for competence. It's not cool to be a mom. It's cool to be rich and hot. It's cool to be 30 and successful and to own your own house, but it's not cool to have two little human beings that really care about you. We've essentially caused women worldwide to become disenchanted with motherhood because motherhood is not seen as high status. And so if given the option to trust a man to take care of me while I produce three to four human beings who are going to love me, ideally, love me more than life itself, that I will also love and take care of and they will be my pride and joy, as opposed to living like, I don't know, Kylie Jenner and being hot and being a boss babe and 
making a lot of money. I think there are a good number of women who are choosing now that second path as opposed to the first one, being disenchanted with the feminine archetype, being disenchanted with the idea of being a mom. Now, what's really interesting is that two of the only groups who have been able to maintain their fertility rates above replacement throughout this whole thing has been conservative Christians and religious Jewish people. And I'm dead serious. I think the reason why is because unless you view masculinity and femininity as divine and sacred categories, unless you see femininity as valuable in and of itself, rather than the pursuit of masculine attainment and dominance over others, but instead the pursuit of being the life giver, the source of beauty, comfort, joy, peace, rest, to your community, to the people around you, to your family, to your children. This, by the way, is why in the story of Adam and Eve, Eve is called the Hebrew word for life giver. So before she even has children, he calls her the source of life. And the idea there is that the ideal feminine identity is the source of all life. And in the New Testament, you have this idea further instantiated in 1 Corinthians 11. You have this passage about how the attributes of masculinity are meant to be a reflection of the attributes of God and the attributes of femininity are meant to be a reflection of the attributes of the universe. And so in some sense, the glory of man and the glory of woman, these are divine, these are special, these are unique, these are set apart categories. And the union between a man and a woman is a sacred union. That's how you get marriage. That's how you get the idea that a woman's status is not rolled up in dominance and competition. It's rolled up in the fact that she is the life giver. Now, this does not mean that all women need to be moms. I'm not saying that. Obviously, there are tons of substitutions and proxies for that role. There are plenty of women who do not have children who are a mother to many, if you know what I mean. But the point remains that if you remove that story, that narrative, that archetype, and if instead we all show our daughters... Captain Marvel, where it's like, hey, look, she's like, you know, the strongest of all the Avengers, and she's like the fastest and the coolest and the most dominant. And that's what you should be like. You should be like her. And so just to be clear, I'm not saying that women shouldn't go to college. My daughters one day, I hope they go to college. I hope they get a good job. I hope all of that. But I also hope that they fulfill that feminine archetype of being that source of life, joy, peace, comfort to her husband, to her children, to her community, to her church. That is a story that we're not telling. It has long been the case that we don't consider it a beautiful thing to be a mother. You can either have the attention of many or you can have the affection and admiration of few. And it could very well be the case that until we bring back that narrative, that idea, the world may literally collapse in on itself. But hey, I don't know. You know, it's just my opinion. Let me know what you think. Comment, like, subscribe, do a little bell thingy. See you in the next video. Peace. Sometimes.